Nick mentioned that I'm the, uh, I'm the director of the LBJ Presidential Library. And uh, one of the great things about being the director of that library is, is there's a, a larger than life president in LBJ behind it. And everybody has a great story about Lyndon Baines Johnson, our 36th president. But one of my favorite stories has to do not with LBJ, but with an event that happened at his White House. So LBJ was a master at getting things done. And one of the things he was able to do was get people to see his way of thinking. He just knew how to push the right buttons. He could read people, something that you folks, I think, have a talent for given what you do. Lyndon Johnson was a master at it. And he knew if you wanted to get to somebody, if you wanted to do something really nice for somebody, you do it for their children. So LBJ threw an event at the White House on the South Lawn. It was a carnival for all the children of lawmakers. And so he had his social secretary, Bess Abel, organize the conference. And so it fell to Bess to get the ponies that, were, that, that would uh, take the kids around and the Ferris wheels and all the things relating to a good carnival. And so one of her responsibilities was to get the crystal balls for the fortune teller tent. So she calls a crystal ball manufacturer in Pennsylvania, and she tells him what she wants. I want three crystal balls, I want them this, this size. Guy takes the order, he says, where do you want me to send these? And she says, the White House. And there's a pregnant pause on the other end of the line, and he says, the president knows these don't work, right? <laughs> Why guarantee if those crystal balls did work, the first thing that Lyndon Johnson would want to know is, how is history going to reflect me and my administration? Because honestly, there's not a president who takes office who's not worried about what history will say about him. There was a woman named Claire Booth Luce, who was a congressman from New York and a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, the, the wife of the founder of Time Magazine, Henry Luce. And she used to lecture presidents. She said, history will remember you in one sentence. And then she would illustrate. She would say, Lincoln, he freed the slaves. And then she would ask, what will your sentence be? There are 45 million documents at the LBJ Presidential Library. 600,000 photographs. But here's the thing. Despite all that vast information about the, the, the legacy and the times of Lyndon Johnson, he'll probably be remembered, per Claire Booth Luce, in one sentence. So I want to ask you, what will your sentence be? We might not make history in this room. We might not make our mark on the world. But make no mistake about it, you folks in this room are vitally important. What you do means something to people. People engender their trust in you. They put their faith in you. You are responsible for transacting what might be the most important thing in their lives. You have their asset in your hands. What you do is important. So how do you want to be looked upon? Because that's your reputation. That matters to what you do. That matters to your future. And people are probably going to remember you in one sentence. Yet Nick Siegel, he really took care of me. He cares about me. Those kinds of things, that's what people are going to be, are going to remember. I thought about this conference, and I was thinking about an interview that I did with Jimmy Carter a couple of years ago around the Civil Rights Summit, which Nick mentioned a moment ago. And the, there's a clip from that interview which I think encapsulates the theme of this conference. I wonder if we could play that. Can you do that, Alyssa? What would you say oh. to young folks who, like you, want to make a difference in the world? Well, yeah, I get that question every now and then. As I said, I've, I've taught at Emory University for 32 years, and I've seen young people come and go, and, and they, sometimes the generations are somewhat different as far as idealism and self-sacrifice on the one hand plus making a lot of money on the other. And, of course, it mixes you all the time. But uh, when I'm asked this question, I, I give two answers. One 
is, is, is part of my inaugural speech as president. I'm the only president that ever quoted a high school teacher. And uh, her name was Miss Julia Coleman. And in my inaugural address, I remember that Miss Julia Coleman told me, we, and other students, not just me, uh, we must accommodate changing times, but cling to principles that never change. And I think that's the best philosophy I know in one sentence, because fast-changing technological world brings together you know, different kind of people and different kind of environment and different kind of transportation, different kind of communication. But there are certain principles in life that never change. And, and that has to be the bedrock for our existence. And so that's, uh, that's one of the things that, that I recall. So we must adapt to changing times, which is really what the theme of this conference is about. But we have to cling to principles that never change, it's core values. And I can tell you that while presidents may be remembered in one sentence, those sentences are rooted in the core values of that individual. So Lincoln, he freed the slaves. That speaks to his strength and compassion in fighting the Civil War and bringing us out of that a united nation. Nixon's sentence wouldn't be as flattering, right? speaks to his core values, his flaws as an individual. I've had the great good fortune of knowing five presidents in my lifetime. And I, I'll talk a little bit about the lessons that I derived from each of them and how they informed my core values. I'll start with Gerald Ford. There, many of you in this room probably weren't born when Gerald Ford was president. But the one lesson that I derive from Gerald Ford is the importance of doing right. Jerry Ford came into office, the first and only president to take office under the auspices of the 25th Amendment to the Constitution, which says that we can appoint a vice president if there is not a vice president who has been elected, if somebody has resigned. Spiro Agnew was Richard Nixon's vice president, resigned in scandal, unrelated as it happens to Watergate, Gerald Ford was appointed, and when Richard Nixon resigned due to Watergate, Jerry Ford took office. And Jerry Ford was the antidote to the imperious Richard Nixon. He was open, and he was honest, and he was decent. And there was this great honeymoon that ensued after the morass of Watergate that we slogged through for two, almost three years. It was a new day in America. And the fate of Richard Nixon hung in the balance. There was the legal fate of Richard Nixon that was tying up everybody. We didn't know what would happen to him, even though he had left the White House amidst this scandal in disgrace. And there were major pressing issues that we faced as a nation at that time. Stagflation was bringing down our economy. The Vietnam War was still not resolved. There were so many issues that had to be addressed, and very quickly. Ford knew, though, that as long as the fate of Nixon remained in question, we couldn't get on to those more pressing issues, that people would be preoccupied with what would happen to Richard Nixon. So a month after coming into office with this great reception by the American people, he does the unthinkable. He pardons Richard Nixon. And the day before he pardons Richard Nixon, which was met with thunderous controversy, he plays a round of golf with his friend Tip O'Neill, who at the time was the Speaker of the House of Representatives. They had known each other for years. And Ford lets O'Neill know that he's going to pardon Nixon. And, and O'Neill says, Jerry, if you pardon Nixon, you're going to lose the presidency in your own right in 76. I guarantee it. And Ford says, that might be true but it's the right thing to do. So the next day, he pardons Nixon. And his lofty approval ratings plummet overnight. Two-thirds of the American people think he did the wrong thing by pardoning Nixon. And sure enough, it costs him the presidency in 1976. He loses to Jimmy Carter a couple of years later, solely because of the pardon of Richard Nixon. We just never 
got back to trusting Gerald Ford after that. But we also moved on as a nation. And Jerry, that's exactly what Jerry Ford wanted. He wanted the nation to heal from Watergate, and getting Nixon out of the way would allow us to move on as a nation. I met with him years ago in, in uh, Rancho Mirage. I went to interview him, and he, it was one of the last interviews he gave, one of the first interviews I had as a journalist. And we sat together. He was really old. He couldn't hear very well. And we sat so close that our legs touched. And uh, I asked him about that part. I said, have you ever doubted that decision? Because you never got the presidency in your own right. You were never elected by a national electorate to hold that office. And he said, I haven't doubted it for a minute. I said, how do you want to be remembered? He said, I want to be remembered as a healer and a builder. And if I am remembered in that manner, I would be most grateful. That was a direct quote. I'll never forget it. Well, you know what? When he died two years later, that, that two-thirds of Americans who disagreed with the pardon flipped. Two-thirds of the American people agreed with the wisdom in granting that pardon and appreciated Ford's decency and his courage for granting it. Ford was looked upon as a guy who did the right thing at a pressing point in our history. And you know what? He is remembered as a healer and a builder, just as he wished. So that's Gerald Ford doing right. Jimmy Carter. That's Jimmy Carter on the far right there. You can see him with uh, Jerry Ford next to Carter, uh, Ronald Reagan, and Richard Nixon with his back to the camera. That was taken in 1981 around the, uh, uh, just after Anwar Sadat was killed in Egypt. And uh, then President Reagan sent a contingent of former presidents to represent the United States. But the lesson I derived from Jimmy Carter is not doing right, but doing good. Jimmy Carter, at this point, had been out of office less than a year. So imagine this for a minute. Um, you're sitting outside the Capitol. Five minutes ago, you were president of the United States. And you're watching your successor address the nation, the same nation that just overwhelmingly voted you out of office and now gives you a dismal approval rating of just 31%. You uh, have just lost a million dollars in a failed re-election bid. In addition to the million dollars you just realized you lost in a blind trust that was managing your money while you were president. You're going back to your hometown, population 640, to a house you haven't lived in in 10 years. The, your, your daughter, who's only in eighth grade, has decided she wants to go to a boarding school, leaving you and your wife empty nesters far before you thought you'd be. You and your wife are entering into what you describe as an altogether unwanted life, and you have no idea what you're going to do next. Now imagine this. You wake up 22 years later in that same house in that same small town to find out that you've just won the Nobel Peace Prize. That's the story of Jimmy Carter. It's a remarkable story. He defeats Gerald Ford in 1976, goes on to one largely failed term in office, and he leaves with this unfinished agenda, having no idea what he's going to do with the rest of his life. But he decides He's going to pursue the agenda that he began in the White House, which is an agenda based around peace and human rights. And he starts rebuilding his life and realizes he wants to do good. And so instead of just erecting a presidential library, he erects a presidential library with a presidential center attached to it, aimed at addressing problems that he wanted to look at as president, including uh, finding out, out solutions, cures, to little known but pervasive third world diseases like guinea worm disease and river blindness, things that we would never even know about and that had been unaddressed by the world community. And so Carter does this very successfully. And a guy who wanted to be remembered for peace and human rights as a failed president wins the Nobel Peace Prize and becomes perhaps our most important former president. Just shows you the resilience of Jimmy Carter and his will to do good. That's doing good. You all have an opportunity not only to do right in your jobs, 
like Jerry Ford. I mean, there, there are decisions you make every day that are vitally important to your client. You also have an opportunity to do good in your communities. You are ambassadors to your communities. Jimmy Carter has played that role magnificently as a former president. Ronald Reagan, optimism. The guy just had boundless optimism. He took over after Jimmy Carter when we were in the doldrums as a country. I heard Nick talk about this yesterday. Nick talked about uh, what partners trust does, what, what you can expect from them as the representative on your home. You can expect that they will be ambassadorial, they, they will be a great strategist, and that they will be a great negotiator. That's essentially what Ronald Reagan became for the United States, this great ambassador of the American brand. He built the American brand back up after the malaise of the Jimmy Carter years. He believed in America. He had this vision for what we could be. He used to talk about the great shining city on a hill. I still don't know what the hell that means. <laughs> but it sounds pretty damn optimistic, isn't it? That's how he saw America. And sure enough, our chests began swelling with pride once more in being American because he was boundlessly optimistic about who we were and what we could accomplish in this world. And one of the ways that he was optimistic was through humor. One of the most important contributions, probably the most important contribution he made as president was negotiating with the Soviet premier, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, at a time when the Cold War dominated geopolitics in the world. And so when a president got together with the head of the Politburo, the head of the Soviet Union, that was a big deal. These summits were a very, very big deal. The entire world community focused on them. And so when Reagan met with Mikhail Gorbachev for the first time in Vienna in 1985, it was truly historic and the world waited with bated breath to see what would occur. And there was great tension around it. And you know how Ronald Reagan began what could have been a very tense meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev? With humor. And Nick talked about this yesterday. He talked about, you know, when you get this person in a listing who's looking like this, how do you break through this and get to this? So you can have a good dialogue. The way that Ronald Reagan did it was with humor. And he told Mikhail Gorbachev a joke. He said, talked about this old woman who storms into the Politburo and goes into Mikhail Gorbachev's office. And she says, Mr. President, we need reform in this country. Why, do you realize that in the United States, I can march into the Oval Office, pound my fist on the desk, and say, Mr. President, I don't like the way you do things. Gorbachev says, my dear woman, you can do that anytime you want. What, when, anytime you want, anything that's on your mind, you just come on in, come to my desk, pound your fist and say, Mr. President, I don't like the way Ronald Reagan does things. <laughs> totally broke him. Totally broke him. When he got Alzheimer's, uh, typically, and, and characteristic of Ronald Reagan, he told people with a joke. I mean, something that was, that was as profoundly sad is, I have Alzheimer's. He made into a joke. He talked about this guy who's sitting with his buddy Joe. And his, his buddy Joe is becoming a little forgetful. And he says, Joe, I got to tell you, your memory's not what it used to be. Uh, you're starting to forget a lot of things. And I tell you this, Joe, because uh, I'm, I'm forgetting a lot of these things these days. And I went to see my doctor. And my doctor told me I have uh, early onset Alzheimer's. So I, you, you might want to go see uh, my doctor. He said, well, yeah, yeah, I'd love to see your doctor. What's his name? He goes, oh, what's the name of that, um, that, 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 that flower really... Smells good, it has thorns. Joe says, a rose? He goes, hey, Rose, what's the name of that doctor? <laughs> Ronald Reagan's boundless optimism and his humor helped buoy our nation at a time when I think we were in real peril. And we came out of it believing in ourselves. Optimism is absolutely endemic in what you do.
because you face obstacles every single day. Not only do you have to remain optimistic, you have to have your clients remain optimistic. So that's a pivotal part of Ronald's, Ronald Reagan's sentence. George H.W. Bush, humility. Ronald Reagan is unduly given credit for winning the Cold War. It didn't quite happen that way. He did help. He certainly might have precipitated it. But it would have happened inevitably. When it did happen, we were very lucky to have in the Oval Office George Herbert Walker Bush. Bush talks about all the time the lessons he learned at the knee of his mother. She would always say, George, don't be a braggadocio. George, it's not about you. It's about the team, George. And he grew up taking those lessons to heart. When the Berlin Wall fell, when the Iron Curtain descended, there was a, it was a time when there could be potential chaos in the world. And the news media came to the White House and, and, and they said, Mr. President, you know, this, there's this cataclysmic event that just occurred. The United States won the Cold War. Why aren't you more excited about it? And, and Bush kept his enthusiasm at a minimum. He didn't figuratively dance on the wall, didn't give this rousing victory speech of how for many years we had rose up against communism and now it was in the ash heap of history. And there was a good reason he didn't do that. Because he knew if he did that, Mikhail Gorbachev would be compromised. And there could potentially be hardliners who would rise up and prevent it from happening. Give one more last gasp to see if we could hold things together. And so by being humble in that very jubilant moment, he was working behind the scenes to ensure that the Cold War ended with a whimper and not a bang. And that's no small thing. Uh, he tells a great story about Margaret Thatcher, with whom he's pictured here. And it was right after the Cold War ended, both of them were out of office. And they were in a great hall in Prague that gathered together many of the principals who were in place when the Cold War ended. And so in this great hall, there was Vaclav Havel uh, and Gorbachev, Margaret Thatcher, Helmut Kohl, George H.W. Bush. The only living person of significance who wasn't there was Ronald Reagan, who was at home here in California, ailing from Alzheimer's. And George Bush talks about Margaret Thatcher going up to the lectern as the first speaker at this great conference and he does this very, very bad impression of Margaret Thatcher. And she gets up there and she says, let me be clear from the outset, Ronald Reagan and I won the Cold War. And Bush hears this, and he is just pissed off. How could you say something so ridiculously braggadocious when there are people in this very hall who serve time in prison fighting for freedom. And as he's stewing about this, Helmut Kohl, the chancellor of Germany, scribbles out a note in English, which he passes to him junior high school style. Bush opens it up, and there are the words, is this woman nuts? <laughs> so humility is a very important part of George Herbert Walker Bush. Again, I think there are times in your careers where humility really comes into play. When you got that listing and your rival didn't, best to probably be humble about it. Don't spike the football. It became very important at that moment in our history to have a humble leader. Next one is Bill Clinton, and that is tenacity. Uh, Bill Clinton had a penchant for scandal. We knew that when, he, when we elected him. We had Jennifer Flowers, and we had Paula Jones, and then we had Whitewater, and we had the White House travel office. When he left the White House, we had the Mark Rich pardon. There's just the whiff of scandal followed Bill Clinton everywhere. And of course, there was Monica Lewinsky. Monica Lewinsky. 
And when that happened, uh, the Republicans really saw an opportunity to put the screws to Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton realized this. And his strategy was just keep on working for the American people, something he was pretty good at. Remember, he was famous for saying, I feel your pain. I feel your pain. Remember when he said that? <laughs> but, but, but he really did. I mean, he's a very compassionate guy. And he really did try to understand the needs of the American people. And he tried desperately to address those as president. So when he was beset by scandal, he just kept his head down and he tried to show the American people every single day, I'm working for you. They might have my character in question, but just remember, I am working for you. Do you remember the cartoon character, Baby Huey? A big old duck, I think. He'd say, I'm like Baby Huey. I'm fat, I'm ugly, but I keep on coming at you. <laughs> That's exactly what he did. He just kept on working, and guess what? Finally, the cloud of the Monica Lewinsky scandal dissipated. He finished out his term remarkably. Who would have seen that coming after all of those details came out about the Monica Lewinsky situation? Next one is George Walker Bush. Bush 43, he's called. And for him, it's to whom much is given, much is required. This is a guy who grew up in privilege. His dad was a multimillionaire. Many could argue that he would never have achieved the presidency without his dad. It's probably right. It's probably right. Although I will tell you, he's a whole lot smarter than people think. And he would have been a very successful politician if he had chosen to be, with or without his father. But Bush realized that he had it good, and that we, as Americans, have it good. And what people don't realize about George Walker Bush, to the extent that they might, is at a time when people were ignoring the plight of AIDS, in, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, which was killing off people by the hundreds every day. He invested billions of American dollars to help to alleviate that plight. And it worked. It worked. The, the effort was called AMFAR, a PEPFAR, the presidency, uh, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. And I asked him why you did this. Why did you do that? Billions of dollars. Very few people really noticed, except in Africa, of course. Africa's of little consequence to us economically. Why'd you do it? He said, because I realized that if I hadn't done this, years from now, people would look back and wonder why the most prosperous nation on earth let this problem fester and didn't do anything about it. He said it was a little investment when you really think about it. And to whom much is given, much is required. So I've learned great lessons from all of these presents. The one thing that they have in common, vastly different legacies, vastly different core values in many cases, but the one thing that they have in common is they all love their country and they all did their best. I'm convinced in knowing them and knowing what they did, that they did what Nick said yesterday in his session. They left it all on the floor. They gave it everything they had. Some succeeded, some failed. And I think, to a large extent, their sentences in history are still in the balance, because it takes us at least a generation to sort that stuff out. Maybe more. In the case of Lyndon Johnson's presidency, it's far more than a generation, because it's so complicated. But I can tell you that that sentence will be rooted in a core value that is endemic to who they are. So I'll ask you one more time, what is your sentence? Thank you very much.